thanks very much and uh, thanks for inviting uh, myself and Richard here to, uh, to talk on deep brain stimulation. As Richard said, there will be a bit of an overlap between our talks, so I, I do apologise if I go over some of the, uh, some of the ground that, uh, that Richard covered, but uh, I think uh, the important points should be the ones that we, um, that we emphasise. So to try to give you a, a broad view of what deep brain stimulation is being used for at the moment, Parkinson's disease is by far and away the most common indication and the most common um, uh, clinical use for deep brain stimulation and I think that that will remain uh, that way for a long time to come. There are a number of other different movement disorders such as essential tremor, dystonia and more recently Tourette's syndrome that where applying deep brain stimulation to treat. Psychosurgery, treatment of depression and uh, obsessive compulsive disorder is also another growing field. Uh, we're also using it to treat some patients with epilepsy and some patients with pain. So why is it called deep brain stimulation? Well we're really stimulating the structures which lie quite deep within the brain, you know, four or five centimetres from the surface of the brain and you can see in this diagram that the structures in the centre of the brain are usually the ones that we're looking to, to target and Dr peppard has been through um, some of the uh, targets that we, that we use. Deep brain stimulation is a form of neuromodulation and neuromodulation is a term that's being used quite a lot now to describe the alteration of function of the brain or the nervous system by electrical stimulation. We can apply neuromodulation to the brain itself, um, we can apply it to the spinal cord and we can apply it to the nerves. So basically anywhere where there's a component of the nervous system from the head to the tips of the fingers we can use neuromodulation. But obviously I'm going to be talking about deep brain stimulation. The application of deep brain stimulation for Parkinson's disease um, should be put in a uh, historical perspective. Probably in the 19 50s and uh, early 60s, uh, surgery for Parkinson's disease was actually very common because we didn't have medications like levodopa. And then at about that time, sort of the mid, mid 1960s, I think, um, uh, levodopa came in and that revolutionised the way that patients with Parkinson's disease were being treated. And surgery nearly died out for, uh, for quite a while. It really um, stopped being used in, used in a lot of centres and was used much less frequently in, in other centres. And that was certainly the case until about eight to ten years ago when uh, it became clear that medical therapy does have limitations. And at that time it also became clear that there were significant technological advances which allowed us to change the way that we treat Parkinson's disease. So what happens with Parkinson's disease? As you all know, this is what's called a neurodegenerative disease. It, it progresses with time. The medications, whilst they are usually quite effective in the early stages, their, their effectiveness may wane over time and um, it may diminish over a number of years. And that, that varies from one patient to the next. The medications themselves may cause intolerable side effects and uh, Richard put up uh, a, a video of a patient with dyskinesias and talked about that and these are some of the other problems that we can run into. So there are certainly limitations of medical therapy. So when should surgery be considered? Well, if you get to the point where medications aren't providing a significant benefit, that's a time to at least consider it. If you're having severe motor fluctuations or dyskinesias, you're going from one extreme um, of movement to the other. You're moving around so much that you can't sit still or you're going to the other stage where you're essentially frozen. If the side effects of medications are intolerable, I think that that's another situation where you would want to at least think about surgery. As Richard pointed out, there has certainly been a trend towards earlier surgery uh, and that trend has happened over the past four to five years and there's increasing evidence uh, to support the use of surgery earlier rather than later. And we particularly apply this um, philosophy to the treatment of patients uh, you know, who might be younger, who might still be in the workforce or trying to remain in the workforce, patients who are starting to suffer from some of the social problems that come with a chronic illness like Parkinson's disease. 
What we're seeing is that when you treat these patients earlier, you tend to get better results. And certainly in my experience, the patients that I've treated over the past five years or so that haven't had very good results have tended to be patients that have really got, gone too far. And in retrospect, um, we probably shouldn't have offered them surgery. And we're starting to learn that looking at our, looking at our results. So we're, we're seeing better results with earlier treatment. As was pointed out, surgery for uh, Parkinson's disease and other movement disorders originally consisted of burning holes in the brain or making lesions, pallidotomy, thalamotomy, those sorts of things. I think Michael J. Fox had a, a thalamotomy or pallidotomy. That's an older technique. Still is being used and still occasionally does have a place, but by far and away the vast majority of patients who come to surgery now will receive deep brain stimulation in most of the uh, modern centres. So this is an example of a thalamotomy and you can see there and actually when you look at the size of the brain that's actually a pretty decent sized change there so it's not as precise as one would would like to see and certainly not as small an area that we're affecting with deep brain stimulation and that's one of the reasons why we've gone away from doing these lesions because it's almost uncontrolled to a degree. We can heat the brain up and have an idea as to how much of a volume we're, we're um, stopping uh, from working. But really that can vary from one person to the next. And whilst it's often effective, if you make that hole in slightly the wrong spot, the patient will have a stroke. And it is irreversible. You know, if, if, it, if it wasn't quite in the, the right position, there's nothing you can do about it. Generally speaking, if you're putting an electrode or a wire in the brain, if you put it in a, in a wrong spot, you can generally take it out and put it in the, the better spot. So that's, uh, that's one of the problems with lesion or surgery. So that brings us to the advantages of deep brain stimulation. Now, deep brain stimulation inactivates a small volume of brain around each contact. It is very, very effective. It does have lower risks than the older lesional type surgery. In theory, it is reversible, it's adjustable. And the good thing about it is we're not destroying the circuitry of the brain. We're not making changes like we would be if we were burning holes so that, you know, in five or 10 years time, if there's a, an effective um, stem cell type treatment or a viral vector treatment or some other novel or new therapy, patients may not necessarily be excluded from having those treatments um, because we haven't gone in and destroyed the circuitry that those treatments may need to utilise in order to offer a benefit. The problem with deep brain stimulation is it is higher maintenance. You've got this hardware system in your body and you've got to look after it, much like looking after a car. It is expensive. These systems, you know, you're talking about thirty or $40,000 here for, for the hardware, potentially, and whilst that's uh, affordable for the patients in the private health funds because they're all covered, um, uh, certainly in the past it's been difficult in the public system. We are finding now it's getting easier to, to do these operations in the public and we've certainly been fighting for that for a long time. And there's an increasing recognition within the public system that this sort of treatment must be funded, like doing a, a heart bypass or something like that. This is just as important and just as legitimate um, uh, a form of treatment. And so I think we are seeing an increasing tendency to, uh, to fund these surgeries in the public system.